just to let you know that nurses are demanding to know how are we not only going to train them, but how are we going to make sure they are safe when they deliver that care. And you can only imagine things that we've been thinking about. And I want to tell you, Gina is very modest. She came to me in the very early stages of all of the planning and said, Joyce, we've got to do something. And the urgency in her voice made me realize from an administrative standpoint, we've got work to do. We've been meeting with our local community uh, emergency management people, our local government, and y'all, it has been such an honor to be a part of that. You know, we pull together, we put our ideas together, trying to figure out not just what we're gonna do for the hospital, but you know, how are we gonna handle this for the other uh, facilities, such as the nursing homes, the schools? How are you gonna handle it if you encounter someone that's traveled abroad? Our daughter works for a company that uh, makes lab laboratory equipment, and they're one of the, the leading uh, companies that they make these very small blood analyzers and other equipment for hospitals and clinics. And she told us the other day that they have had this big surge for orders for their uh, equipment to the point that they are on back order for some of these. Why? Because people are still trying to figure out how are they going to test for this and then conduct business as usual for the other patients and not contaminate their equipment. Can you see how from an administrative standpoint, how that could really be tough if you're trying to figure out how you're gonna pay for something you didn't budget for that is changing every single day? Uh, with the Magnolia Regional, Health, uh, <coughs> Magnolia Regional Medical Center, with our plan, we are focusing on three, three areas. One being to detect, to make sure that we know how to detect Ebola, to make sure that we can protect our employees, and then make sure that we know how to respond appropriately when the time arises, should we ever have a real patient or a potential patient. Now, you might say, well, the odds are, you know, if you've looked at some of the statistics out there, the odds may be very low that we'll have an actual patient. But one thing for sure, y'all, know that we're going to be ready. We, we cannot afford not to be ready. <coughs> Working with our local emergency management, as I said earlier, and our local government, we've been able to come up with ideas and um, be able to, to think about, you know, what do we need as far as supplies and equipment, and how much do you keep on board? Can you see how mind-boggling this can be? And it can consume a day or two. Lastly, I just wanted to let you know from an administrative side that we have to have a contingency plan, uh, not just for staffing, but like I said, as far as making sure we have supplies and how do we get more supplies. Um, we had some training the other day where um, the nurses were able to put the suits on, and I know maybe some of you have seen those suits. They're, they're not very flattering, but you have to make sure that you put them on correctly and you take them off correctly. It makes you stop and think from times when you may touch your face or your hair and not think anything about that. That could be detrimental if you're not careful. Uh, the other thing is that our contingency plan is that we have to make sure that once you have a patient, then how many people does it take to take care of just one patient. And for me in nursing, we may be looking at you know four nurses per shift or more, depending on how, how well they're able to tolerate being in those suits. So that is my part. I'm going to turn it over to Gina. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Like I said, for having me. And I want to clear up one thing. I did not uh, graduate from what the information I have is a little more detailed than um Jordan did a great job of kind of outlining how how big this is, um, how far it reaches in our community and involves different facets of our community. Um, she's right, hospitals are scrambling uh, everywhere for answers on uh, how to contain this, how to respond and treat appropriately, and what are we going to do. Um, 
And so I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about Ebola. I'm sure you've heard plenty, but um, as members of the community, I want you to have a better understanding of uh, more specifically what we're doing uh, at the hospital. Um, it is a modern healthcare crisis, although it's been around since the 70s. It was discovered in Africa near the Ebola River, and that's how it gets its name. They think it spread through bat backdroppings, um, local people there. Handle and eat the bush meat uh, in the area, and they get it there. And that's that's where it starts. There's been isolated outbreaks in Africa since the time it was discovered, and they've always been able to trace it and contain it. But this time was not the case. It was too widespread. They couldn't trace all the um, contacts and contain it as quickly. <coughs> and it is a historical outbreak, not just because it's so large, but it's the first time it's ever reached. Um, unfortunately, that started in Dallas um, when a man presented there from Africa with vague symptoms. Um, they treated him, sent him home, uh, didn't recognize that he had Ebola until he turned back with more of the definitive symptoms of Ebola and the travel history. And the travel history is really the key because the very first sign that you're going to have is fever. Well, it's cold and flu season. <laughs> and so there's going to be a lot of people showing up with fever. You don't want to wait and find out they have fever before you start asking questions. You want to ask the questions first about the travel history. And that's possibly where they missed the mark, is not getting the travel history. And of course, um, not to criticize that hospital because um, they were the first. And how bad would that be to be the first person? You know, you think that Ebola's not in the U.S., and then you have the guy and show up on your doorstep. And like Jordan said, it may not be that likely that we'll have anybody else, but you have to be prepared because you never know. So Ebola is in the same viral class as norovirus, rotavirus, and flu. Um, that's your cold and stomach viruses. So if you have any cleansers that will kill those, it will also kill Ebola. Um, outside the body, they say it's pretty unstable, um, that it can be easily killed with those cancers. But once it gets inside your body, it uses your RNA to replicate and spread throughout your body. And it sounds like it does that pretty aggressively, uh, since it just takes days for people to be really sick. And I believe that's what happened with this uh, first patient that was in Dallas, um, because he's the only American victim that has died. But he was really sick by the time they figured out what was going on with him. And so he got all the treatment the rest of them got the um, experimental drugs, the blood transfusions. I know they were off, the blood transfusion was off the drug, but he took that. But um, he was basically just too far gone. He was very sick. Um, when the amount of the virus grows in the body, it's referred as the viral load. So they said he had a very high viral load. The virus can be found in an infected person's blood, sweat, tears, saliva, urine, stool, and semen. And once a person is cured of it, it can be still found in semen for up to three months. And, um, and it takes a very small amount of the virus to cause infection. That's why the um, personal protective equipment um, covers every inch of your skin, <laughs> and there's such stringent rules of putting it on and taking it off. You actually have to have uh, what they call a buddy to help you put it on, to look at you, make sure you're covered, and to watch you take it off. Because if you, like Jordan was saying, if you slip up, touch a little something, or brushes your face, um, you know, it could be deadly in, in very small amounts. You may not realize it. Some of the nurses that got sick never really knew how they got sick because they just, they didn't remember doing any of those things. The um, precautions are contact and droplet, and that's something we've been doing in for many, many years. Um, the virus can enter your body through mucous membranes, your eyes, nose, mouth, any breaks in your skin. Um, those original nurses caring for this first patient had covers that came to here, and their gowns started here. And as they pointed out on television, you know, it's, it's your neck, but how close is that to your mouth and your eyes? And if you do this and, you know, touch without even realizing um, symptoms are fever, severe headache, muscle pain, weakness, diarrhea, vomiting, 
um, stomach pains and unexplained bleeding, um, or what we call fatigue, yeah, that little red rash on your skin, which is really bleeding under the skin. But some might describe that as a rash, but it's really bleeding. The first of the symptoms is fever, but um, we would prefer to detect a person based on a travel history before we find out that they have fever. <coughs> By the time you find out somebody has fever, they may have sat in your weight room, uh, gone through your hospital, gone through an admission process. So the first thing that we did was put the signs out. There's signs asking anybody coming into the hospital uh, at all points of entry to let somebody know immediately if they've been to any of the travel <coughs> locations. So um, once you tell, if you come in and tell us you've been there, the first thing we're going to do is isolate you. It's like isolate, ask questions later, you know, but you do continue <coughs> with your uh, reaction process. Um, so early symptoms are vague. It can look like, um, you know, just your cold, flu, anything else. Um, so what happened? was the CDC, uh, upon hearing that we uh, have Ebola, is they responded, they uh, referred to their 2007 isolation guidelines, which were current um, for anything else that we've ever known. But the problem is Ebola is not like anything we've ever known. So this is how our nurses got infected and how they missed uh, detecting that first patient early. They relied on the guidelines that were given to them. And I'm not really trying to fault the CDC because they were um, they were caught off guard like mm -hmm. everyone else. They had to do something, so that's what they did first. So once we started getting infected nurses, we knew that changes had to be made. CDC knew changes had to be made. They started working on upgrading their protocols, upgrading their guidelines on what type of personal protective equipment that you wear and uh, just more stringent guidelines on uh, caring for the Ebola patients. While we were waiting for them to update their guidelines, they finally released those on October 20th. We realized that we had to do something. We could not just sit and wait um, for them to update these guidelines. And again, I'm not faulting them. I'm just saying we knew that we needed some early action. So our community, um, different organizations came together. We had meetings, we had discussions. Uh, we knew we had to decide what to do to protect our hospital employees, patients, and community members. Because um, we didn't we didn't want to be in the news uh, being the people that, um, you know, let this spread because you just were relaxing or not, not thinking about it or just thinking it's not going to happen again. Because it could happen anywhere. So, we started uh, looking at advanced PPE, uh, personal protective equipment. That had already been distributed through the hospital but in the early stages, uh, probably similar to what the Dallas Hospital had, but we started upgrading. We started changing. Um, we started reaching out. Um, well, actually, some of the first things that were done were reach out to community contacts reading CDC website, learning everything that we possibly could. And then that process kind of started over again. Um, learning and changing and um, revising strategies. Uh, employees had been taught what to wear, when to wear it, questions to ask, and then to kind of, if you will, kind of look that over. And um, we continue to do that. If I had to sum up our plan in three words, it would be detection, protection, and isolation. Um, I've done a couple little um, mini drills, if you will, in our hospital, um, in the emergency room, because I, I feel like that's where the first patient is going to come. And I just went in and told the clerk, I just said, I've been to Sierra Leone, and I don't feel well. And she immediately said, put this mask on, put your hands together, stay put, and I'll call somebody she closed her window, and this is exactly what she's been taught to do. Um, they say if you put at least six feet immediately between you and that person that you suspect may uh, have Ebola infection or been to one of the areas where they have it, that, you know, if you don't have that window to slide a clothes or a mask in them, 
put the space between you and that person and then call for help. So um, I was very pleased with that. But um, I just want to say that it is an ongoing um, process. Um, we do have protocols in place. We have personal protective equipment. Um, we know what some of our plans are. We are constantly revising, adding, growing as we learn more and more about Ebola. We have cleaning protocols. We have three cleaners in the hospital that will kill at hospital waste cleaners. Um, and I would like to call this the evolution of Ebola preparedness because that is what it is. Um, and I'm happy to say again that not only our hospital but our community has come together. This is a community approach because um, sometimes when you don't get the outside information fast enough, you just have to get together with your folks to protect your folks. And um, I feel like that's what we've done. Um, I hope I've answered uh, some of your questions uh, that you may have if anybody uh, has questions about it. Um, a lot of people have asked me some questions. What do we do in this situation? What do we do in that situation? What if they walk in the clinic? Um, and I've tried to get answers to that, um, but I don't have every answer. But that's that's why it is a community, and it's really um, like Dorothy said before. Um, hospitals are scrambling for information and for answers. And so um, I would like to conclude saying that we are continuing. We have a dedicated Ebola preparedness team. <coughs> We have regular meetings, um, and we just continue to learn and grow. So if anybody has any questions for me, I will try to answer them. And if I can't, I'll see what I can, what I can find out. Yes, sir. Gina has to be an infectious waste contractor or we do accepting waste like this or not? We have talked to our infectious waste contractor, and they have uh, done their research. It's, um, I believe, a dot three is what it's called, um, waste management. And what we found out was they can um, apply for the license to transport the waste, but they have to wait till we actually have to take them. They will not be given the license until we actually have them used up. trying to do, and yes, I have heard that, I, have, I, I do have an opinion on that, um, and I think it's fantastic that nurses go uh, and serve in those in Africa and try to help contain that. These are uh, dedicated people, and some of what news media is saying is that we're being punitive to them to ask them to stay in their home once they return for three weeks, um, but I think if they told them up front that that was part of accepting the, you know, the deal to go there, because you do accept certain restrictions and uh, dangers when you go there. I think if they told them up front that when they come home that they would be expected to quarantine for three weeks, I don't think that their feelings would be so hurt because there's a lot of talk about it being punitive uh, to those people that go and serve. Have y'all evaluated the risk with the exchange student program at the university that whether we have any I, I have not. I, I do know that, um, you know, they've designated like five airports that anybody coming from any of the affected areas will be routed through one of the five airports where they screen.
contact the people that you have to contact, like the Department of Health and the CDC. But yes, um, you do everything you could to protect that person's privacy. About 2005 or 6, uh, Homeland Security had come down to SAU. We had to develop a contingency plan where if there was a big flu pandemic. I mean, what year was that? that was um, I don't remember. That's been a few years ago. Uh, when swine flu first came out, I think. But uh, there wasn't a plan, because I know we had to write it, that would. Uh, Magnolia was going to be quarantined, cut off for the limited highway. And then they had dormitories targeted to six people on. Has that been dusted off? Of course, a flu pandemic is probably going to spread much more easily than Ebola. But um, have you all had to dust that off? Well, we have recently reviewed that plan. Um, Probably there should be a separate plan just for Ebola that's similar to that since um, it's much more, um, I don't want to say much more contagious, but <coughs> it's just different in that you get it so easy. The viral loads are, you know, go up so quickly and only take, they call it highly innocuous. And so it, it's just very different than anything that we have ever uh, known before. One more question. I got one. 